Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Melissa Siegel, and I'm a professor of migration studies. So even in these crazy times of corona that we have right now, all needing to work from home, I still wanted to make sure to bring you some of that all important migration content. And I'm really excited today to have a very special guest with me, Dr. Jessica Hagenzanker, who is a senior research fellow at the uh, Overseas Development Institute. Now, she's also very much specialized in migration research and migration policy and has been working on these areas for quite a long time. So today, what we actually want to talk about is understanding migration decision making, but in particular, looking at the implications for policy. Now, if you're interested actually in just how migrants make decisions, I'll link another video that I've done earlier on my channel where I look just at how migra migrants make decisions. So please check that out if you're interested in more of that. What is important to note, though, from the very beginning is that um, there are many decisions that migrants need to make or can make in the whole migrant decision-making process. Those are things from whether they even should leave or whether they should migrate, if they do leave, where they should go, and how can they actually get where they want to go or how should they actually make the migration journey. So these are just a few of the decisions that migrants actually need to make within this process. So of course, what does this mean for policy? Well, what we see in practice is that policymakers make a lot of assumptions about how people make migration decisions, and often these assumptions are not correct. And this is actually some of the work that Dr. Hagenzanker has done. So how, so Jessica, can you tell us just a little bit about how can policymakers actually take this into account? How can they take into account how migrants and really just individual everyday people are making their decisions? Thank you, Melissa. Um, so you're watching this YouTube channel because you know that migration is a really important policy agenda. In one of the earlier videos, you've probably also already seen that um, many countries all over the world, um, including in Europe, are spending a lot of money on migration policies. Um, so for example, there's the EU Trust Fund for Africa, um, which is worth um, more than 4 billion euros, um, which um, seeks to promote stability and address so-called root causes of migration. Um, and the EU um, recent budget has again tripled my, um, spending for migration management. On the surface, um, a lot of these policies talk about aiming to better manage migration, to make migration safer and more predictable and more orderly. So for example, that's also what the Global Compact for Migration talks about. Um, but when you look at these policies um, a little bit below the surface, you actually realize that many of these policies are about prevention of migration. So about deterring migration um, from happening in the first place and about stopping migration that has already happened. Um, and these so-called tackling root causes and supporting development in countries of origin are really important um, policy agendas at the moment. A few weeks ago, you ha actually had a very interesting discussion with um, Professor Heinde Haas about um, these policy agendas, and he mm -hmm. talked about the fact that actually these policies often don't really work. Um, he said, and just for everyone that's watching this video right now, I'll make sure to also link that other video in case you want to catch up right now on what Dr. Hagenzanker is talking about in a conversation I had with Professor Heinde Haas about uh, also on migration policy. Sorry, go ahead, Jessica. Yeah. And um, so what um, one of the things that Heinde Haas mentioned is that these policies are often not evidence-based and um, they're put in practice to address populist concerns. And yes, that's definitely something I'd agree with. Um, Hein also said that migration, um, is, um, migration policies are not effective because they're not, they're not um, based on an understanding of migration as a social process. And that's something I'd like to pick up on today. Um, I, I'd like to talk about how migration policies actually need to consider how migrants themselves act and operate at the micro level 
So um, what I'd like to talk about is that we need to understand people's aspirations, their behaviors, and their decision-making processes. Um, because only once we understand that can we design policies that actually work. Yeah, thank you. You're absolutely right. And I think, you know, obviously most migration scholars, most people that really know what they're talking about, like you, for instance, and like Professor Heinde Haas, all agree on this point. And I know that you've been doing quite some work recently where you've also um, been giving some advice to policymakers. I think you even have, for instance, four key lessons for policymakers when making policy in this area. Can you tell us about those? Yes. Um, so the, the work I've done for policymakers is, um, is um, I've I talk about the fact that um, migration policies on paper as designed by policymakers often don't look like that when, when they reach actual migrants. Um, and um, I've developed um, a, a framework of sorts. The framework shows that policies actually get diluted or transformed in some way um, from the policymakers' desk by the time they, they reach um, migrants. Um, and um, so the first stage where policies get transformed is when it gets implemented. Um, so when policies are implemented, they often end up looking a little bit different, for example, because there are staff shortages or competing policy priorities or, um, or just not the yeah, capacities in, in a department to properly into implement a policy. So that's the first stage where we already see policies looking a little bit different. That's a, a kind of a common policy problem, right? There's there's what is written kind of in the books, and then there's what is translated into practice. And what is translated into practice really relies on human beings, right? And human beings have their own will and their own ability to make mistakes or also their own possibilities to not follow the rules. So I think implementation here is definitely kind of, as you said, the first um, way in which we can see breakdown or changes from what is originally meant. Yes, absolutely. That's um, that. Yeah, that, that and that's really important to um, to think about the fact that it's people implementing policies, it's people receiving information about policies, and people interpreting policies. And that's kind of where the next two stages or gaps come in. The next gap is the communication gap. Often these policies are put in place, um, and then no one's told about these policies or. The information that's shared about these policies is not very clear. Um, it's not directly targeted at migrants. It might not be in the languages which they speak. Um, so information can get lost or distorted along the way. It might be passed on by word of mouth or kind of Chinese whispers. So um, it can look very different um, by the time it actually reaches migrants. Um, and that has real implications for how people actually respond to these policies. If they only have partial information or distorted information, they might actually respond in the very ways that policymakers don't want them to respond. So, for example, one study I worked on a few years ago looked at Eritrean refugees in Ethiopia, and these refugees were often very unsure about how the resettlement pro um, process works. So, for example, how long it takes, how likely it is that they'll get accepted. And, of course, this resulted in a lot of stress for, for these refugees when they were waiting for years and years and years. Um, but over time, they just lost faith in this formal process because they didn't know how it worked. And it meant that the risks of um, migrating irregularly to Europe um, became much more tolerable to them over time. So that's an example to show that not having the right information has, has um, clear implications to the success of those policies. Absolutely. So I think we've already got then two clear kind of lessons for policymakers. And what's the third one? Um, yeah, so then um, the, the information gap um, is something that policymakers are mostly aware of, and there are all these information campaigns for policymakers. That's an obvious area for policymakers to to work in. Um, what's I think less obvious is that um, it's not just about um, sharing information, but it's also about how people interpret that information. Um, 
So um, people perceive, interpret information often quite different to how it looks on paper. Um, they have their subjective understanding, um, but also um, people's aspirations color, color their interpretation of policies. So for example, um, they might be really keen on, on getting a better education or getting a really good job. So they only consider those type of policies and they don't consider um, information which doesn't interest them. So um, this, this, is an, um, this is a really crucial gap and one that's often um, neglected by policymakers and um, one that's actually really hard to address, um, but, but very, very important to, to think about the fact that um, migration decision making isn't a, isn't a rational process, but it's, it's very subjective in, in many ways. I think um, a, a lesson that comes out of um, this last gap um, in terms of um, let's look at how people really perceive things is um, to look at, um, at policies beyond migration policy. Um, our the under, my research, but also other research on um, on migrant decision making has shown that it's often not migration policies that shape people's decisions but the broader public um, policy environment, so for example, access to education, labor market opportunity, safety, um, human rights, they're much more important. And that means that to actually influence um, people's migration decisions, policymakers need to cast the web much wider um, than just looking at migration policy. Um, so, for example, labor market policy is obviously really important, um, but also other sectors, and that means that um, policymakers um, need to have a whole of government approach. So, working um, working together across sectors, across ministries, um, in order to influence migrant decision making. Thanks so much for that, Jessica. So, if there were just kind of um, a couple of key points that if policymakers weren't going to take away anything else from this talk, um, what are those key points that you really want them to, to keep in mind? I think the key point is understanding how people um, how, how people make their decisions and um, what people aspire to, what they want. So not just making assumptions about the, what they want, but really, really, really looking at that and then addressing that rather than um, going out with a, with a policy objective of let's stop migration. If we mm -hmm. come and we see that um, people aspire for, for better working conditions, then yes, or, or better job, then let's work on that and find, for example, legal pathways of making that possible and then sharing that information. Information campaigns are often focused on, for example, just the negative aspects and don't migrate irregularly, don't come here. And that, um, that just puts people off as any parent of um, wouldn't would know that if you just share that kind of information, of course, um, people will do it anyway and they just don't want to hear that. So focusing on what is possible, these are some alternatives at home, this is a way of migrating is um, often leads to, to better results. Thank you, Jessica. This is really, really helpful and I think adds uh, more clarity on this subject. I want to thank you again so much for being uh, um, a guest even in this time of COVID-19 on my channel. Uh, for those of you who are interested, I'll make sure to add some more information about Dr. Hagazanker's work and some of the additional things that she is also doing. I'll also make sure to link to some of my other videos that very much relate to these topics. Please, if you liked this video, like it, subscribe to my channel, and do please interact with us. Ask questions, and I'll really try to make sure to address those in next videos. So thanks again so much for being with me, Jessica. Thank you all for still tuning in, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.